welcome everyone. My name is Julie Larry, and I'm the Director of Advocacy at Greater Portland Landmarks and I want to thank you for joining us tonight for our Bayside History Night. Um, this year Greater Portland Landmarks received a Historic Preservation Fund grant from the National Park Service. Uh, it's a planning and survey grant that's administered here in the state by the Maine Historic Preservation Commission. And the grant this year was to document historic resources in areas projected to be impacted by rising sea levels. And I think everyone is pretty aware that there are definitely some flooding occurrences that are happening in Bayside on a fairly regular basis. Uh, those are matching grants that we received and the work that we've completed this year wouldn't be possible without the generous donations we receive from our membership to support our preservation and education activities like this evening. In addition to thanking our members and the National Park Service and um, the Maine Historic Preservation Commission, we'd like to thank the Mayo Streets Arts Center for hosting us this evening in this historic building so that we can present some of the history and images we've collected this year. And I'd also like to thank the East um, Bayside Neighborhood Org for helping to promote the event. And I'd really like to uh, give a special thank you to all the neighborhood residents and the staff members of the City of Portland who helped provide information and shared their stories and time with our interns this summer. The City of Portland has become an increasingly popular place to live and to work and to visit, and much of that we believe can be attributed to its historic buildings, neighborhoods, and landscapes. Outside of the designated local historic districts in Portland, much of the historic architecture, especially in areas off the peninsula, haven't been very well researched or documented. And because of the, some of the growing trends to provide greater density and growth in some of these neighborhoods, we in the last four years have conducted a series of surveys of historic buildings along Stevens Avenue, Forest Avenue, and in the Oakdale and Deering Highlands neighborhoods of Portland. And last year, we continued that earlier work with surveys in East Deering, Nason's Corner, Morrill's Corner, and on Peaks Island. Our survey work is in part being completed in advance of significant city efforts to comprehensively rezone the city and to enact policies to boast growth in specific areas. Um, many of you, I hope, participated in the 2017 Comprehensive Plan. Um, in that plan, Portland has prioritized 14 node areas, which you can see as the blue, orange, and purple dots on the image in the lower right. Um, both East and West Bayside have been identified as um, nodes for evaluation and enhancement um, in the city's comprehensive plan. So we have known that we've wanted to survey Bayside for a while. We actually did some very early survey work in the 1970s in Bayside and we did a survey of the West Bayside neighborhood in 2000. But we wanted to carry on that earlier work and over the last couple of years, we've been educating ourselves about the possible impacts of climate change and how we as a nonprofit organization can help owners of historic resources better pre prepare for that challenge. And one element of the solution we feel is to prepare our homes to consume less energy. So a few years ago, we published a booklet on how to make your old house more energy efficient. I have a sample copy here tonight if you're interested and would like to look at it. And we also have them for sale on our website. Uh, but we also knew that we needed to think about the impacts from recurrent flooding and we, needed, we knew we needed better data. So as I mentioned, we knew that we wanted to focus in part on Bayside because of the city planning efforts. We knew we wanted to look at Bayside because of its recurrent flooding issues. Um, but then we also decided that we wanted to look at different neighborhoods that might have different types of building stocks. So we also focused on the Ferry Village neighborhood in South Portland, which if you're not familiar with South Portland, is this area here between the uh, river and Broadway as you head out to um, Southern Maine Community College, which is over here. You can see there's quite in this flood map, quite an incursion of flooding that comes fairly deep into the neighborhood. Um, we've also conducted a resource of 12 of the wharves, uh, 12 of the oldest wharves in the central waterfront in Portland this year. 
Uh, our hope is, is to take the information that comes out of the survey work we've been doing this year. We've received some grant funding for next year. We've applied for some more. And we're hoping to come up with some case studies that will provide recommendations on ways that you can make, as a property owner, your building more resilient, not only to flooding, but to extreme heat and high winds and different effects from climate change. So what is a resource survey and what does that mean? Um, you may have seen our interns this summer out in the neighborhood. I know that some of you did. Um, they documented each building in the survey area with a photograph and recorded information about its materials and then they did some research on its history. They also documented features that might be impacted by weather events. Um, when thinking about water impacts, we looked at the location of utility entrances, entries that might be below grade, uh, the location of basement windows if there was the presence of exterior fuel storage on the site. Um, when thinking about wind impacts, we looked at were there the presence of mature trees very close to the house, were there things on the building like satellite dishes or antennas or other things that might be blown off in a storm. And we also looked at heat impacts, so do the buildings have AC, are there shade trees that while the limbs might come off in a storm, in the summertime when they're leafed out they're providing uh, shade um, and to help keep the occupants cooler. These are all data points that we um, came up with in conjunction with the sustainability officers both in the city of Portland and in the city of South Portland. All of the information from our survey this summer is going to be given to both of those departments for their use in their one climate action plan that they've been developing over the last couple of years. All of that data goes into a state database. Um, it is actually compiled by traffic engineers at the main DOT. Um, so it says the main DOT public map viewer. You can go in there and uh, turn on the historic preservation layer. And you will see these little, um, I call them monopoly houses, for lack of a better way to describe them, that will populate the map. Uh, you can see that these purple areas here, these are historic districts, so we have the Eastern Prom, we have Baxter Boulevard, a number of the downtown districts. You'll also see there are some red buildings. Red buildings are properties that are listed on the National Register of Historic Places. You'll see um, an orange couple of orange buildings. Those are buildings that have be been determined eligible for listing on the National Register but are not yet listed. Uh, the gray buildings are buildings that have not been determined not eligible. And then most of the green buildings that you're seeing in the Bayside area, um, ones that were entered this summer, you can just start to see off in the corner. Last year we did um, um, Baxter Boulevard, uh, Boulevard Park, rather, was the development over here on the cove um, that we did. So in this database, uh, you can click on one of those little monopoly houses and uh, the survey form will come up, the picture of the property, and it will have a little bit of information on the history and materials of the property as far as we were able to determine during our research this summer. Um, as you can see from these images, the projected areas of flooding that have been um, projected for the peninsula pretty much correspond to those areas that were infilled in the 19th and 20th centuries to expand the Portland Peninsula, both on the Back Cove side of the peninsula and along the waterfront. The image at the bottom is actually an image that was created a few years back for an exhibit at the Osher Map Library um, by Rosemary Mosier. Um, she took uh, 2001 aerial imagery and then she took some historic maps and overlaid them, uh, which I think is pretty amazing to look and see um, how, the build, how the peninsula has transformed geographically over a period of time. That um, image that she used to overlay on the, on the satellite image actually came from this map um, of 1781 Falmouth. Portland was part of a much larger area which included Cape Elizabeth, South Portland, Westbrook, and Falmouth, known as Falmouth. I think I wanted to show this image tonight mainly to, to not only 
uh, have you think about how narrow the Portland Peninsula was here. This is the uh, layout of Congress Street. So you can see it was quite narrow going down the hill towards Bat Cove, but also to really look at the inlet of Bat Cove and how it crossed over um, what is now Forest Avenue and, well, actually Forest Avenue is over here somewhere. This is um, Brighton Avenue and um, uh, a Deering, Deering Avenue here. Um, so this is Deering Oaks and this is headed over towards um, the Hood Dairy and uh, what was the school they just tore down? Was it the West, West School? Yeah. So Portland really was a peninsula with a very narrow neck at one point. Um, thank goodness we don't have to all come in that way in our cars, right? Um, so this is just a few years later. This is in 1815. This is a map from the Howard University Library. Here we have, you can see it's called Back Street. Um, that was, that's Congress Street. Uh, Four Street was the first street. Middle Street was the middle street. Back Street was initially the back street. Um, very practical people. Um, and is this is going to work. There we go. You can see that there is Cumberland Avenue uh, partially laid out. It doesn't quite extend as far. It's going from Washington Avenue over here to what would become Forest Avenue. And you see there's a few of the streets leading downhill towards the cove. Here's another uh, one of those maps from the Osher exhibit. Basically, uh, just a few years later, showing about the same sort of development of the Bayside neighborhood. Not a lot of development at that point. We love this map because we love Lemuel Moody at Greater Portland Landmarks. He was the builder of the Portland Observatory, which we operate. And this is one of his maps that's currently in the Osher Map Library. And uh, I put this one in to show that just a few years later, uh, not only was there Cumberland Avenue, but Oxford Avenue was laid out. And we start to see more co cross streets um, coming into the neighborhood. We use a lot of historic maps in our research to understand how the neighborhood developed, why certain houses are where they are. Sometimes you come up to a house and you're like, why, is, why does this house exist in a neighborhood of much earlier houses? Um, or why is this really late house surrounded by all new houses? It's interesting to understand how neighborhoods developed and subdivided. And it also helps us in our research into who was living in the neighborhood, why they were living in the neighborhood. Uh, this is just another map about a decade later. And then I really love this neighborhood, um, this map of the neighborhood of actually most of the peninsula from 1866 because this one shows the little black dots are buildings. And you can see at this point there's a train station in Bayside. You can see the tracks extending out to the west, out right around where they go now across uh, Deering Oaks, in the back of Deering Oaks. And you can see this big black dot over there, that was the Monroe Street Jail, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a few minutes. Um, you can start to see uh, more development, a, a lot of density in this part of the neighborhood, a little bit less densely um, developed on the downhill slope from Washington Avenue. Um, this is Washington Avenue going out to Tukey's Bridge. Um, so 295 is about here. So this is, um, this is just before the Great Fire of 1866, uh, July 4th and 5th. Um, so just remember those dates. We'll talk about them in a couple of minutes. But here is that jail that was on Monroe Street, um, built in 1858. It was demolished in 1966. It took up that whole block that was bounded um, by Monroe and I think Smith Streets. This is a bird's eye image. These are generally pretty good drawings of municipalities. Um, the way these were constructed is they would send uh, illustrators out into the field to document properties and then that um, information would go back to where they would assemble these great uh, bird's eye maps. So when you really uh, zoom into these and look at the bays and the porches and the um, 
the, fl the floor plans of some of these buildings. They're remarkably very well detailed. But I wanted to, um, I love it, I think it's a great way to talk about how the neighborhood looked. Um, here's that train station over here. And we now see just 10 years after that last map, this trestle that was laid in um, across the back cove. That trestle connected this train station, which if you remember from the earlier map, just had tracks that went out to the west, and allowed that to connect up to the Atlantic and St. Lawrence Trails um, uh, Railroad that run around the east, eastern prom. You can still see there's water here in its basin area. And for those of you that may have seen the image that we used on the advertisements for this meeting tonight, uh, we had a couple of people ask us about this, <laughs> where this was. Um, this is that railroad trestle. You can actually see the train sitting on the tracks. This is Tukey's Bridge. This is East Deering out beyond Tukey's Bridge. Um, this is about where the off-ramp coming from Washington Avenue down towards Fox and Anderson Streets is. Um, Washington Avenue up here. And then this is water. This is another really useful map that we use in much of our research because as you can probably see at this scale, there are names on all of the properties. So that helps us and we're looking to see who some of the early owners of a property might be. This is from the Atlas of Cumberland County. This is a INSAP map of part of the Bayside neighborhood anyways. You can see this is the uh, Monroe Street Jail over here. Um, here is the train station. You can just see in a dashed line they're starting to lay out Kenny Beck Street here. Um, off the map is that railroad trestle that's going back around uh, the Eastern Prom. Lincoln Street became Lancaster Street. Uh, you can see the cathedral here. Uh, the cathedral was under construction during the Great Fire of 1866. Um, however, it was severely damaged and had to be rebuilt, so this was probably still partially under construction at that time. You have the city hall here um, in Portland High School, um, just down the street. What I, I really want to point out in this image, though, is how incredibly densely built up this residential portion of the neighborhood is. Um, it's, it's vastly different than what we experience today. Bayside is actually one of the oldest existing neighborhoods in the peninsula because of the Great Fire of 1866, which destroyed much of the early settlements um, and early neighborhoods here in Portland. Um, it occurred on July 4th and 5th, as I said earlier. This is an um, engraving uh, an image taken from the South Portland waterfront looking across the harbor at the downtown. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, this is the path of the fire. It started down near Hobson's Wharf, near where Becky's Diner is, spread up to the north, uh, to North Street, and just um, uh, portions of the neighborhood just off Cumberland, um, sort of east of Wilmont Street were impacted in the Bayside neighborhood. It largely impacted uh, the downtown and the India Street neighborhood. Uh, 10,000 people were left homeless. Um, this occurred, as I said, in July. Um, there, was a, there was a big need for housing after the fire. And that's when we really start to see a lot of the development on the Western Prom, the Eastern Prom, in, in the Deering neighborhood around Woodford's Corner and out along Forest Avenue as people moved out of the dense city center and tried to uh, separate commercial and retail from the residential neighborhoods. Um, because initially downtown had been much more of a mixed use uh, with very high-end residential right next to um, industry as well as banks and newspaper offices. It was, it was a more of a jumble than we know of it today. Here's just one image from the fire. This is taken, I believe, from the foot of Exchange Street looking uphill. Um, all of Exchange Street, the reason Exchange Street looks the way it does is because all of those buildings were pretty much rebuilt within a two to three year period after the fire. So they're very similar in style. Uh, the downtown was, was pretty much wiped out. Um, most of the banking establishments, I believe all of the, the newspapers and City Hall, the Customs House were all heavily damaged or destroyed in the fire. 
Another great set of maps that we love are those created by the Sanborn Fire Insurance Map Company. Um, insurance, you wouldn't think that they're exciting for researchers to know about, insurance folks, but they were insuring buildings based on their fire risk, so they documented what a building was built of, you know, what its materials, its structural materials were, um, and they documented what was going on inside of the building. It's an amazing collection of maps. There are maps from 1886, 1896, the early 20th century, and the mid 20th century for Portland. Um, I pulled this section because you can see here at the top, Marginal Way is proposed in 1896. This is another, oh, this is actually from the 1914 Richards map of Portland and South Portland. Uh, the pink buildings are brick buildings. The yellow would be wood-framed buildings. You can see Kenny Beck Street near the top where the uh, railroad tracks are coming down. And then um, just off the top of the image are, is the rail yard off Somerset Street. This is an extremely densely developed residential neighborhood that was um, north of Cumberland Avenue. And we know that this neighborhood, like many of the other neighborhoods in Portland, had a variety of building types. There were single family residences, there were tenements, there were apartment buildings, there were even row houses, which you can see in this image, you can see the brick row houses here, like you might see on Danforth or Park Avenue in um, the western ends of the city today. I wanted to mention that you really start to see um, the differentiation and the development between the residential neighborhood which existed north of Lincoln and later Lancaster Street and then the, um, the, the industry that started to happen along the waterfront along Bat Cove. There's a planing mill here. This was a, I believe this was a um, cabinet, cabinet cabinetry works um, building and there was the Portland Stove Foundry and then we have the first scrapyard that we see on one of the maps coming in on Somerset Street. This is also from the 1914 map. So here's that trestle coming out around the neighborhood. There's Anderson Street coming down into the neighborhood. You can still see the big basin there, not yet filled in, but certainly they were starting to think about what they were going to be doing there. Um, I just wanted to point out this green square. This is labeled Bayside Park. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute, but just to kind of get you oriented. Um, and you can see down here, this is the reservoir that was up on Munjoy Hill. You can just see part of it here on the map. I'm going to follow that up with this aerial image from 1940. You can, to help key you in, there's that um, Munjoy Hill reservoir again. Uh, they have filled in the basin now. You can see that. This is where that Bayside Park was. Um, this was the trestle line that they filled in coming down to Marginal Way, which didn't extend too far at that point. Um, and so this over here would be the intersection of Park. This is Deering Oaks and this is Forest Avenue. So here's a, an image of that Bayside Park. Bayside Park was built in 1913 on the north side of Fox Street and was bordered by Boyd and Mayo Streets. It was home to Portland's New England League team, which was owned by a gentleman named Hugh Duffy. In this image that you see on opening day, there were about 9,000 people in attendance. The <laughs> virus threat protection, sorry. <laughs> um, the facility was also uh, used for boxing matches and there was a circus that would come here. When Portland, or now Fitzpatrick Stadium, was built in 1931, the New England League moved over there and Bayside Park was used for Twilight and Sunset League games. You can see the cathedral uh, towards the right hand, I think that's the cathedral. Um, um, this is looking from Washington Avenue down into Bayside. You can see on the right-hand side of the slide uh, the water not yet filled in. And you can see Bayside Park, the grandstands that were there around the ball field. And of course downtown in the background off to the left you can see, I believe that's the Fidelity Building, the tall skyscraper. A skyscraper, it's not a skyscraper in Portland, but you know what I mean. <laughs> 
Here's another aerial image. This one's from 1956. Uh, this happened to have been taken at low tide, so you can see the shipping channel that was dredged out of Back Cove near the top of the slide. Um, you can see just um, this, just down on the slide from the mud flats, marginal way has been extended out across where that basin was, um, where the trestle inside of the trestle area, and we start to see some of the industrial buildings that we're familiar with today down along Fox and Anderson streets are, are starting to be built. Uh, the Bayside Park, the, the ball field, has gone away, um, and I think it, you know, again, at the bottom of the slide, those, those last two blocks all across the bottom, you can see really uh, dense residential neighborhood. Here's just a, an image of the intersection of Forest Avenue and Marginal Way. You can see the channel coming in here almost all the way to the intersection. So Deering Oaks and the castle is over here. Um, I was reminded last night when I was at a meeting, they were talking about uh, the water table in the park, that when we, um, I worked on the project when the castle was converted, and I got a phone call from the contractor the day they took the concrete floor up, and he said, the water is gushing. Um, it was like a stream pouring out of there. Uh, the pretty high water table here because of the old, um, the, the stream, the tidal stream. And as I remember I, I was showing images like this at King Middle School one day and the kids got really upset because there was no Hannaford. <laughs> Where did people buy groceries? <laughs> so this is from 1970. You can see the construction of 295 being prepared, all of the infill that's happening, the sandy area at the, near the top of the slide. Um, Preble Street extension coming around here and what would become the site of Hannaford where we can all buy our groceries. Um, and, and of course you can see coming down through the middle um, Franklin arterial under construction. And uh, part of Kennedy Park being constructed and um, the noise moving and storage buildings here. Yeah, and here's the, again, the Monjoy Hill Reservoir still, still there in 1970. Um, this is a really great map that's available on uh, the Maine Historical Society that documents all of the shoreline changes that have happened over the history of the neighborhood. Um, I think it's pretty, I won't go into all of them because we've, we've really been looking at them, but I think this was a really nice composite map that someone put together a few years ago. Oh, well the fill came from a lot of different places. Um, part of the fill came from Munjoy Hill. A little bit of it came from debris from the Great Fire. Some of it was dredge material. Some of it was brought in. Um, they got it from a lot of different places. So the next few slides I'm going to go through are not really before and afters, but um, there's uh, going to be a historic image at the top of the slide and a present day image at the bottom. Uh, most of the historic images are from the 1924 tax assessors database. The uh, city of Portland is very fortunate to that in 1924 the city photographed all the income producing properties in the city. It's a great record of what was here. Um, in 1924. Um, likewise, the assessors in uh, 1882, I believe, uh, went through the city and did uh, floor, floor footprints of all the buildings and created a map and labeled all the property owners. Those are really great maps that we use a lot as well. So this is the Nathaniel Hamblin house. This is an excellent example of the federal style. It's, one, it's a good example of one of the early homes in the neighborhood. It um, has had some slight changes around its entry, but it still pretty much looks the same as it did in 1924. Nathaniel Hamblin, this was built in 1827 for Nathaniel Hamblin, who along with his two brothers, Eli and Joseph, uh, were prominent early developers in Portland. He did some speculative building in the western end of the city. Um, he's known for the Hamblin Block, which was a series of four row houses from 188 to 194 Danforth Street as well as a number of other buildings at um, from 194 to 208 Danforth Street. There's a single family and a couple of duplexes, as well as the four townhouses that he built um, that form the Hamblin Historic District on the National Register and are now part of the West End Local Historic District. The next two buildings that I'm going to show you were houses that were owned by the Maine's Home for Friendless Boys in the early 20th century. 
the uh, organization was founded by Mary McGregor, who formed the Society for the Protection and the Care of Friendless and Destitute Boys in 1893. Uh, the organization would purchase homes such as this and its neighbor at 138 Oxford Street um, to provide a safe home uh, for young men until permanent housing situations could be found for them. Um, I always love photos with the kids in them and then the tax assessors are taking them. Um, but I also put these in to show that these buildings, this one is a bit more um, altered than the one at 138. But you can see when you look at it and you go, why does it have this deep entrance? That's very curious. And then you look at the historic image and you understand that that was um, a part of its history. And this one, you can see it still has its bay window, but it's lost its porch that used to engage with that bay window. The next image is of the Scandinavian Bethlehem Church at 58 Wilmont Street. Um, this church really speaks to the immigrant identity in the Bayside neighborhood. It was organized in 1896 by 17 Scandinavian immigrants, although this church was not actually built until 1914. The church was founded to conduct worship services in their native tongue and also to reach out to Scandinavian sailors who were visiting Portland Harbor. By the 1930s, Norwegian language services has faded and all of the services at the church were held in English. And in the 1950s, the congregation moved out. It was um, the first evangelical free church established in the state of Maine and one of the earliest of its kind in New England. The next image is the Preble Chapel. This is actually the view from Portland Street. The Preble Chapel was designed by John Kirby in 1899. It occupies the site of an earlier Unitarian chapel that was built in 1851. The lands and funds for the chapel were donated by Mary Deering Preble. It closed as a chapel in 1977. I have another image. There's an image from the 60s um, and an image from today of the Cumberland Avenue side of the building. Just up the street was the Pythian Temple. This building, uh, the tall building on the right, was built in 1910. The Knights of Pythia was a fraternity originally formed during the Civil War. Um, it was founded by a Freemason named Justice Rathbone in 1864 on the tenets of friendship and charity and benevolence. In 1937, the Portland Jewish community took over the building to create the first Jewish Community Center, or JCC. The communal institution provided an alternative to the local synagogues and was extremely unique um, in the area. It had social activities for Jewish adults and young children, and it had educational programs and children's programming. It remained the JCC until the building was sold in 1979. And here we are. Hopefully you recognize this building. The St. Angars Evangelical Lutheran Danish Church was founded in 1875, and this building that we're in now was built in 1898. It was the first um, uh, building just built solely for the church. The next couple of slides, um, a lot of people who are from the area and lived in Portland a long time have a reaction to this, and I think it's because of the smell of baking bread. Um, this was Cushman's Baking Company. It was opened by New York baker Nathan Cushman in 1915 as an expansion to his White Plains New York Baking Company. He equipped this facility with the most modern machinery and could produce 1,800 loaves of bread an hour. Here's one view of the building and from the uphill side. Initially, that those bread, um, bread deliveries were done by horse-drawn wagons that took fresh bread right to your customer, right to your door. They had six delivery routes in the city. Uh, he didn't turn a profit initially um, because his goods apparently initially weren't very popular. But <laughs> later on, he became a real staple in the neighborhood. And he sold out the bakery in 1962, mainly due to the decline of home delivery services, which impacted his building, uh, his uh, company rather, excuse me. He also founded a summer re resort at Sabasco called Sabasco Lodge, and he had a Cushman's Bakery in Lynn, Massachusetts. This is another building. Um, it's actually gonna be a series of two buildings. This building at 75 Preble Street was the automobile showroom from the Manx Stewart Motor Car Company. He was a, they were distributors of Cadillac, 
and their primary building uh, was actually over on Forest Avenue um, after this. It was built later than this. Um, and that building still exists. The Manx Stewart Motor Car Company was the only service station in the state devoted exclusively to selling Cadillacs. Just downhill from the showroom was the Cadillac Garage, which you can see is still here. And while we're talking about automotives, I can't help but include, although some people say it was built when they were, bo were born, so it can't possibly be historic, but the U-Haul building is indeed historic. Um, it is over 50 years of age. It was designed in 1963. It's a ex great example of mid-century modern style of architecture in the city of Portland. It was originally home to Port Portland Motor Sales, who were the largest Ford dealership in the 1960s and 1970s in Portland. Um, as you can see in the bottom image with the cars there and the great Ford sign. Does anybody know which street this is? This is Franklin. So Franklin Street began in the 18th century as Essex Street. Uh, it ran from Back, which is now Congress Street, down to Ting's Wharf at 4th Street. It was then later extended to the new Commercial Street in the 1850s when that went in, and then later on in, down into Back Cove um, as the neighborhood was filled in. The neighborhood around Franklin became, um, in the very early 20th and late 19th century, a dense mixed-use neighborhood, um, mainly home to a Jewish and Italian immigrant population. I love the cobbles um, in the gutter on the streets in this image. Yeah, this is at the intersection with, um, uh, this is, these buildings still exist right behind the pole here. They're right by the Catholic Church where, so this is Cumberland. This is a map from the 1944 American Public Health Association report uh, down in Portland documenting um, the need for rebuilding in Portland. The report branded the neighborhood's housing in um, the Bayside neighborhood as substandard. It said that much of the housing in the Bayside district was fundamentally so obsolete that it cannot be modernized without improvement, so expensive or so structurally so difficult as to make them economically impractical. It, um, I'm just quoting from a later a source which said it was interesting that what Bayside's critics in the 1940s labeled as obsolete and what we've heard throughout the history of preservation movement since the, the 60s was that um, the neighborhoods that we've later found that we've loved and that planners are trying to recreate were actually the neighborhoods that we had historically in Portland. The neighborhood streets were narrow and its dwellings stood on very narrow lots close to the streets, but the community was dotted with small groceries and other first floor stores, which um, provided amenities to the neighborhood so that you didn't have to get in your car and drive to Hannaford. <laughs> in 1947, there was a um, bad fire in the neighborhood in a tenement and that raised concerns about the condition of the neighborhood. In 1948, the Evening Express, which was part of the Portland Press Herald um, publishing company, published a series of articles on Bayside's housing conditions. And while there were issues of slum landlords and vacant housing throughout the city, the, the focus really came in on uh, the Bayside neighborhood. It was probably not helped by the fact that it was, there was a strong immigrant community of Irish, Scandinavians, and Italians in East Bayside, as well as two, 250 Armenian families. Um, in 1958, nationally, there was immense clearance and replacement projects um, were becoming the norm in American cities. In that same year, Portland Slum Clearance and Redevelopment Administration demolished a mixed-use area between Lancaster, Pearl, Somerset, and Franklin in a phase of slum clearance um, known as Bayside West. Uh, there were 44 units with 31 households and was home to about 85 res residents. And then across Franklin was Bayside Park. So they named the redevelopment um, that would be part, become part of Kennedy Park after the old baseball field. Um, there were another 54 units raised in the Bayside Park area, which was about a 58 acres. Uh, 154 families and 18 small businesses were uprooted. Um, there were about 302 structures in that neighborhood and 200 were rehabilitated, which is a pretty good percentage. And again, about uh, the rest were mostly demolished. 
then you can also see um, in this map of other, um, other redevelopment areas, Munjoy South, um, the Vine Deer Chatham neighborhood, which was down off India and Middle Streets, as well as a, a small area um, called Downtown Number One off Cumberland Ave. This is an image from 1969, the year that Franklin Tower was constructed. If you look just to the bottom left of the screen, you can see the dirt road that's becoming uh, Franklin Arterial. I included this image because um, I have a dear friend of the family who I thought grew up on Munjoy Hill. Turned out she grew up on Quincy Street. She goes, you're not going to know where Quincy Street is. I'm like, yes, I do. Uh, Quincy Street is gone. It's part of the top of the old part parking lot. Um, this was the street she lived on, and her dad worked on Congress Street and had a very short commute. Um, you can see some of the, in 1969, some of those buildings were still there where the top of the old port parking is now, as well as you can still see a fairly uh, dense um, dwellings here, um, the Wilmont Street Church here. Oh, it's over here. It's right here. Yeah, most of it. And then I included this one as well. This is from about 1970, we believe. And I included this one because you can see down here where some of the buildings are starting to, to come down. Um, this is actually an image mostly of the downtown. You can see um, one monument square under construction in this image. But in the back, you can see the bottom of Franklin Tower. You can see part of the neighborhood. As we talked about, that was um, where Whole Foods is now. But you can see that kind of the through the treetops, the residential neighborhood. Uh, I think this is 1976. I'm not quite sure what the date on this one. So as I mentioned at the beginning, part of the reasons for taking in this survey were to um, focus on the impact of what could be happening in these neighborhoods as climate change brings stronger storms, stronger storm surges, uh, more rain events, more um, wetter rain events to the area. So the state has taken the survey information that our interns did this summer. So each of those red dots um, represents a building that was surveyed. Um, and that is overlaid on a projection with a six foot storm, for, storm surge excuse me, at astronomical high tide um, as mapped by the main office of GIS. You can go into our website, go to portlandlandmarks.org historic resources and click on the Bayside neighborhood and it will take you directly to this map. Each of those red dots is clickable. So if you happen to be one of the red dots in that green flood area, you can look at your property and see what elements we um, identified as potentially being um, affected by the impacts of rising waters. So we've taken some of that raw data and created a few charts. Um, we'll continue to use this data over the coming year as we um, develop more of an econ economic impact statement and do some case studies on different property types. This first one was uh, looking at where utilities are coming into the building. Most of the utilities within the neighborhood are fairly close to the ground between one and two feet of grade, which as we think about rising waters could become a problem. Uh, one of the challenges with the way that the data is right now is we can't separate it between um, which properties are actually who have that are in that red bar are actually within the flood zone. So that's one thing we'll be working on as we work with the mapping software. Uh, we looked at where gas utilities are coming into. I used to live in New Orleans. I know that one of the things that happened after Katrina there was water getting into the gas lines became extremely problematic. Most of the gas meters in the neighborhood um, are fairly low to the ground. Um, we also looked at where the entrance was, um, how many entrances were at grade within the neighborhood. Most of the entrances at grade are actually in the, the lowest streets, um, so that is more problematic in this neighborhood than in other neighborhoods we looked at. Um, here's an example of one of those you know, um, lower down buildings that has an entrance pretty close to grade. Uh, we tried to catalog when there were below grade um, living spaces or where there were basements. Of course, most homes 
in Maine have basements, so it becomes uh, flooding becomes a challenge to deal with, particularly when those spaces um, have been made over into living spaces that rises the cost of repairing them. Uh, we looked at where the location of basement windows were, if they're going to be a problem as water is draining down the site. Um, I live on a hill. You don't have to live at the bottom of the hill to have drainage issues. Um, my downhill neighbor, one house from me, has a below grade entrance and all of the uphill water runs into his driveway and into his house. <laughs> um, he has to put a little coffer dam um, out at the end of his driveway every time it rains. We also looked at where drier vents were, other types of vents coming into the house or building. Um, in terms of excessive heat and um, hotter days, we looked at where the presence of air, condi air conditioners, did the building have awnings? That's actually the image in the upper left. Very few buildings have awnings in this neighborhood. And uh, we looked at whether things could come off in a storm like satellite dishes. So almost um, about 17% of the buildings in Bayside had some sort of satellite dish on them or antenna. And then we also looked at negative drainage. Uh, negative drainage is when the area around the basement or around the uh, foundation of the building is lower than the areas around it. So the drainage either coming off the roof, coming down the driveway, coming from the street is actually draining in towards the building. And you can see it was a pretty high percentage. About half the buildings had negative drainage around them in the Bayside neighborhood. Um, We've just begun our work in, in the Bayside neighborhood. Uh, we didn't have a lot of time to do a lot of research on every building. I know that in every neighborhood we've, we've ever been into, there are people who know much more about the history of the neighborhood than we do. And if you have any information that you'd like to share with us that you know about your building or about the neighborhood, we'd love you to share that with us. Um, we're very interested in making that information to available as many people as possible. Um, so I have cards on the back desk, on the back table. If you have any information, please take one, send it back to us, let us know how to get in touch with you and what kind of information you might be willing to share with us. So again, I just want to thank you all for coming out. I want to thank Mayo Street Arts once again, all of our sponsors and the people that we've been working with on this project. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to stay and take a couple of questions, or if you have a story you want to share, I'm happy to hear from you. Thank you very much. Yes? Um, on your, your map of uh, sea level rise, 295 was not in the green so, yeah, this is too high. Because of the elevation, yeah. 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 That's yeah. Anything else? Yeah, I see your hand. Yes. Why did they fill in? Um, they needed land for development. Um, the railroads were a big um, causation for fill. Um, that was the reason that Co Commercial Street was filled in, to connect the railroad station at the foot of India Street with the railroad station at the foot of High Street and connecting over to the Boston and Maine um, that ended up over in St. John Street. Um, that was part of the reason that they put in when the Portland and Rochester Railroad came in, there was fill done for that. Um, there was a land uh, developer who lived on North Street who was part of a consortium of people who um, owned a large chunk of Munjoy Hill and they wanted to um, take some of that fill and bring it down here because they wanted to develop the land down here in the Bayside neighborhood. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to share a little story. There's a guy who lives here in the neighborhood who grew up here as a little boy and he said that the prisoners used to hang out of the jail <laughs> and they'd get the children to go down to the village, like the little neighborhood store by those <laughs> Uh, depends on which section of the neighborhood. Yeah. Um, 
the neighborhood has different patches of zoning within it. It's not all zoned the same. So, um, for instance, in the industrial area down where um, U-Haul is, it could be much denser, taller buildings down there. Um, it's always a discussion of can you rebuild Portland the way it used to be? The answer is generally no. Yeah. I wasn't in the 2017 discussions, but are the discussions to make the new zoning to the area allow denser, taller buildings? Certainly, there are definitely some corridors in some neighborhoods where I think that will definitely be under consideration. Uh, not geographically everywhere in the city. Uh, um, yeah, I don't know that there's necessarily a specific plan yet for Bayside. Um, that work hasn't quite yet started. They're doing some organizational work on the zoning code. They're working on the signage ordinance, um, a couple of other smaller, easily tackled projects. Um, they haven't necessarily re got to the rezoning, which is why we're trying to do this work now so that we have that data and can understand the development patterns because we think a lot of the historic neighborhoods, I mean, we're a historic preservation ordinance, this won't surprise many people. We think a lot of the historic neighborhoods have good walkability and we wanna understand what made them good walkable neighborhoods so that when we're commenting on public policy decisions when it comes to land use, we're trying to get to some of those qualities that made a neighborhood walkable and, and successful with some mixed use where you didn't have to get in your car and go to Hannaford and those sorts of things. Anything else? You know, is the city um, thinking about water mitigation during these? Is that well, yeah. I mean, there's been a huge plan about making the city drain more quickly after storm events. Um, yeah, the city is making some progress in that. I will say that. I was following some of the waterfront conversations in the commercial street study, and I know the question was act, asked at one of the commercial street meetings, well, what are you doing about planning for climate change, sea level rise, and making Congress Street more resilient? And they said, we're going to think about that later. So um, it's happening in some places, not necessarily in others, and it probably needs to be more holistic. <laughs> Oh, yes, George. I just wanted to point out two things. So the land, the uh, Richards Atlas that you showed, mm -hmm. so it was printed in 1914, but whatever they, whatever surveying they did was actually very early in, in, in 1913. Right. And that's why the stadium doesn't show up. Mm -hmm. And also Lancaster, <clears throat> the extension between Alder and Forest doesn't show up either because that came later in 1913 but so it's like funny some of these yeah. historical things you have to take with a grain of salt because they're they back then it was like hand done so right. there was yeah. a time lag yeah right we ran out on we ran into that on peaks island we had very well documented that some of the neighborhoods uh, some of the buildings the cottages were built in a specific year that's when the bird's eye map was published but they weren't on the bird's eye map because the bird's eye map had been drawn in the field like two years earlier. So yeah, you do. They, we use circa a lot because you can never know until you really find something actually in the building that, you know, that indicates when it was built. So. And, and then the, uh, the 1944 um, public health yeah. report. You probably know a lot more about that. Than well, <laughs> I, I actually had the public library put it online so anyone can, can look at it, but that really is the creation of Bayside. Nobody actually referred right. to Bayside as Bayside until the urban renewal era began, where they had to, they, to, they had to create a neighborhood that they could destroy that yeah. was set off from the rest of Portland mm -hmm. so that they could say, well, that is disposable to protect the rest of Portland. So they created a district that nobody, like the 1940 worker writers um, project, the federal writers project under the WPA, the only reference to Bayside is to Bayside uh, Park, um, which was something that people called Bayside Park, but it was right against the water. So that's why they called it Bayside Park. But nobody, if you lived in Bayside in the 1920s or the 1930s, you were part of Central Portland, yeah. or maybe Lower Munjoy Hill. Yeah. You were, there was no nobody said I'm a Bayside right. or you're from Bayside. Yeah. I've, 
interviewed some early residents and um, parents of friends who grew up in Bayside, and they all they all think they live downtown. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Sam. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, it wasn't unique, of which maybe a lot know, to fill in areas surrounding uh, different cities. Right. In Boston, the Back Bay section of Boston, when they cleared hills in Boston, this is down where the Charles River is, mm -hmm. that was all filled in. Yeah. And uh, from hilly areas in the city, and I've never seen an old map of Manhattan, and it's, uh, it extended out maybe 500 yards or 1,000 yards out from what it was. And again, any hill in greater New York City, they leveled, and they took that uh, fill and put it along the water. And when they dug the subways in Boston, they took all of that fill from the subway lines, and the nearest place to dispose of it was just take it to the water's edge, dump it. But by doing that, they extended out Manhattan all the way around by a, th a thousand yards, but quite a way. So what we did here by filling in Back Bay, I'm assuming was done almost all over the country. Back Bay or Back Cove. <laughs> No, it appears both way on maps, but I like to think that the map ma makers who use Back Bay were actually from Boston. So <laughs> that's my comment on the Back Cove, Back Bay. Um, but yeah, no, no, certainly Portland was not unique in this time period. Many, many American cities have filled in areas that were previously wet, and that becomes a concern as we start to think about the impacts of flooding. Um, I mentioned that we did work in uh, Ferry Village as well. We had a meeting over there last week, and one of the things that we came up with that neighborhood is we couldn't understand why deep in that older neighborhood there was this flooding issue. It's a fairly gently sloped neighborhood, uh, certainly not like um, the Bayside neighborhood. And then we found out there was this early stream that got blocked in when they did the fill for World War II, and I said, well, I suspect that that's the reason why there's this cause for flooding. And after the meeting, I was approached by someone who lives next to that old stream in an old 1850s house whose basement floods periodically every time there's an astronomical high tide. So the water table is extremely high. And so even though that's not a visible, when you walk around that neighborhood on a rainy day when Bayside might be flooding, for instance, you don't see the water on the streets as much over there. Um, it's actually coming up through these you know, more permeable basements that they have over there. And these, and it's because it's a fairly old neighborhood. There was a ferry that connected Ferry Village to downtown Portland. It's a, it's a fairly old neighborhood. Um, not quite as old as Bayside, but um, around that same era, um, 1840s era. So, anything else? More fun than that. Could you mention, you, you pointed out the navigation channel yeah. in the back cove. Mm -hmm. So Eisenhower in 1957 signed an order officially um, ending that being a federal navigation channel. And the, so, so the dredging, so they couldn't dredge it anymore. Yeah, there was no longer any obligation for the for the city to have to, uh, you know, maintain it as a as a shipping channel. But it was 1957 was up until then it was still considered navigable. And uh, you know you could you could take a small you know low draft vessel all the way up to basically where the Hannaford is. Wow. That's because the highways, they wanted for the highways. I, mean, like I think it was just they were all bug. I, I think it was Maine bugging the federal government to say, look, we don't want to have to maintain this yeah. this mud flat <laughs> anymore. <laughs> so, but 1957 is in, within a lot of people's lifetime still. So. It wasn't that long ago that you could still theoretically sail a little ship up, up through that cove. Almost right into Deering Oaks, yeah. <laughs> that would be another form of transport that we could have for the neighborhood, right? You could sail to downtown Portland from your back cove neighborhood <laughs> to go to work or kayak. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>